Good morning. Um, it's great to be with you guys today. I am your worship leader. <laughs> um, and I'm just very excited to be worshiping, worshiping with you all today. Um, if you all would stand and sing with me. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. partially here. Uh, if you've ever uh, heard a preacher absolutely high on Benadryl, that's, you're going to get it this morning. So, uh, I, uh, someone, and People have asked me, uh, Brother Jay, is the sermon going to be short? I have no idea. Uh, I may be in my mind be thinking that it's short, and an hour later we walk out. So anyway, we love you. God bless you. A few announcements. We want to let you know we're having our uh, Regular service this morning, no services tonight. I believe we had a fellowship plan uh, tonight uh, at uh, 6. Uh, if you'll be understanding, I don't think I'm going to be able to make that one. So uh, anyway, and so if, but if people want to still be here for that, uh, obviously uh, we, we can still meet. Uh, and uh, then also want to remind you of your year-end uh, contributions. Uh, uh, they will be uh, include uh, anyway. Yeah, you can read that. This is going to be an interesting Sunday. Okay, uh, so uh, just a few other things. Uh, we'll be back to our regular schedule next week. Regular schedule Wednesday with our youth and with our children. Uh, and uh, we're ready for a bright and shiny 2024. We are starting off with a bang, aren't we? Amen. All right. Listen, we love you. And I uh, pray that I make sense this morning. If I don't, just notch that on my, uh, on my record. But uh, listen, we love you. Let's have a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll continue with our worship. Noah, who is here with us, sound body, sound mind. Uh, I may not make sense, but he is this morning, so we rejoice in that. So 
Anyway, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day. We pray your blessing on our service. Uh, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would uh, uh, just help me during this time, during this day. You'd speak to us as a church that, uh, Lord, uh, that uh, ultimately uh, in everything that's said and done, that your son, Jesus Christ, would uh, receive full uh, honor and glory in everything that is said and done in our time here together. I pray for anyone here who does not know Jesus as Savior, that, that uh, you would uh, convict them of their need for salvation. Uh, for Christians who are here who need to be encouraged, I pray that you would encourage them. For uh, those of us who may need to be corrected, I pray that, Lord, we would be corrected by your Spirit uh, in our time here together. Uh, we pray all these things uh, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys, please stand with me again. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou You are good, you 
are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you death has lost its sting. And oh, I'm right into your arms, I'm right into your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, that of the world forever reign. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. That of the world forever reign. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus.
for the seas that you will help us walk through this year, God. We, and we, God, we just thank you so much that, um, that we can r- rely on you and to trust in you to help us through things, God. We, we pray that we will resolve on this New Year's Eve 23 uh, to forget about the past, but to gain wisdom from it. And uh, God, we just thank, we just pray that in 2024 that we'll put your glory first, God. And uh, we pray that we will uh, rebuild broken relationships, Lord, and we thank you so much that we'll be able to reestablish trust in our families. And just remind us that we are truly never alone, God, that you are always there. We'll look seeking us out and looking for us. And God, we pray for others that are going through different crises in the world, and, uh, and we can do that by helping them, by showing up, by by listening, by praying, God, we can never pray too much for them. God, we, Philippians 2.4 reminds us that everyone should look not to uh, our own interest, but to the interest of others, God, and we should always be mindful of that. And uh, Pray for the many that are suffering through illnesses at this time. Be with um, Brother Jay, Brother Greg, uh, Brother Stephen, and others. And, Pray that you would just bring healing and relief into their their households. God, we just we pray for uh, as God's family here at Grandview Baptist that we will be a, a unifying force for your kingdom. Uh, God, we just pray that we also will uh, increase our tithes over the year. That we'll be we'll be generous in our giving, God, since you've been so generous to us. And God, we will just uh, we pray for changed hearts and minds. We pray for decisions that will be made around the world today in Muskogee. Just forgive us of our sins, God. Thank you for just allowing us to trust on you and lean on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. No, I know uh, that uh, your parents are very proud of you, and uh, but I, I we we need to let you know that uh, as your church, we're proud of you too. I, I cannot see, I cannot wait to see what God is going to do in your future, uh, and I believe it's going to be a bright one as uh, the Lord uses you in ministry in church and leading music, and uh, what an exciting time in your life and. Uh, we'll uh, we'll continue to lift you up in prayer. I want to let y'all know I also got a Christmas present, a late Christmas present from Grayson. Everybody, Grayson's right over there. Wave at him right there. Grayson got Brother Jay a, a and I'm not sure what to think about this, but I'm still going to wear it. Uh, but it says Pastor Warning on it. <laughs> Anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. So. Uh, 
Anyway, yeah, pretty cool. All right, let's put that right there. If you have a copy of the Word of God, take it and turn with me, if you will, to the book of 1 John. We're going to look in 1 John chapter 5 this morning, and we're going to look beginning in verse 6. 1 John chapter 5, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse 6. And the Word of God says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood, because it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For uh, there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. By the way, if you're looking at this verse theologically, that is one of the strongest proponents of Trinitarianism that you will find. These three bear witness, the Father, the Word, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and then also the Holy Spirit. And there are three that bear witness on, the word, on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree as one. Now it's interesting as we look in this portion of 1 John that uh, much of what you find in verses 6 through 13, though we're not reading all of them, uh, relates to the witness of the Holy Spirit. Now, according to what the Lord Jesus Christ told us in John's gospel, the, the, one of the primary purposes uh, of the Holy Spirit or his important job is laid out to us in John chapter 16 and verse 13, where it says, Jesus said this, uh, when the Holy Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And so what is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to tell the truth. Am I making sense this morning? And when the Spirit speaks, he speaks truth. When the Spirit speaks in the Word of God, he speaks truth. When the Spirit speaks in our services, he speaks the truth. When the Spirit speaks in our heart, he speaks the truth. And so as we look at this, we should be mindful how in verses 6 through 8, the Holy Spirit tells us the truth about Jesus. Now I want us to see three things that he's going to talk about. He talks about the truth about Jesus' divinity. Secondly, the truth about Jesus' ministry. And thirdly and finally, we're going to look together at the truth about Jesus' Difficulty. Let's see what the Holy Spirit says about Jesus' divinity. Uh, you'll notice that Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit's witness. And one of the things that Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would do in John's gospel, in John chapter 16 and verse 14, Jesus said, he will glorify me. Now I want you to understand that when it comes to the, when it comes to, uh, the teaching of the Holy Spirit or what we're to understand about the Holy Spirit, it's important for us to understand that the Holy Spirit's purpose is never to draw attention to himself. In other words, when we are here together and the Holy Spirit is at work, when we leave this building, the words that come out of our lips should not be, man, wasn't the Holy Spirit fantastic today, though he was. Amen? Our, our speech should be something like this. Oh, how wonderful is our Savior, Jesus Christ. He glorifies Jesus. When the Holy Spirit is at work, he will not speak of himself, but he will glorify Jesus. And so in the Bible, from the beginning to the end, the Holy Spirit, who is the one who inspired Scripture, can we agree on that this morning? All Scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, from the beginning of the end, glorifies and exalts Jesus Christ. Our purpose here, why we are here, and what the Holy Spirit intends to do is the Holy Spirit intends to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, in 1 John, one of the things that we find is that the Holy Spirit tells us the truth about who Jesus is. We find as we read Scripture that he testifies Jesus as God's Son in verse 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5, the Holy Spirit testifies and says that Jesus is the Son of God. Stop right there and I want you to think about that. There is no room for debate on this subject. He is the Son of God and he is God himself. In our Baptist faith and message, one of the things that we say as Baptists is this, that Christ is the eternal Son of God. In other words, he has always been God's Son. He is fully God and he is fully God. Man. So if we are to believe 
what the Holy Spirit says, and if we're to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and believing in that basic thing, it, it, it's basic Christian truth. If you say anything other than that, listen, it is outside the bounds of theological truth. Verse 6 says, because the Holy Spirit is truth. John says in his gospel that he will guide you into all truth. And so because the Holy Spirit tells us the truth, because he tells us the truth, we can believe his claims regarding Jesus Christ. And so he tells us the truth about who Jesus is. You know, there are a lot of people who have opinions as to who Jesus is. Some say that he was just a good teacher. Some say that he was a religious martyr. Others say that uh, he was a rabbi. The only truth that will work is this. When Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew, and I believe it's in chapter 16, the Caesarean uh, uh, Confession, where he said, who do, you say, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're this person. Some say you're this prophet. Some say that you're this or that. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter stood and he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus affirmed that when he said, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father who is in heaven came from the Holy Spirit. So he tells the truth about Jesus' divinity. He also tells the truth about Jesus' ministry. Look in verse 6. It says, this is he who came by water and blood Jesus Christ. And a lot of people have questions as to what John is speaking about here. We find that the water and blood are intertwined here as we, as we think about the truth of what this is all about. Water and blood alludes, in my opinion, to the beginning and the end of Christ's earthly ministry. How, when did his ministry begin? Well, he met, he met uh, his cousin John the Baptist at the Jordan River. Do you guys remember that? And uh, John baptized him in water. He didn't sprinkle. He fully submerged him in the water. That's what the word baptizo means, uh, to immerse. And so he baptized him. And you remember that the Lord uh, descended, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And the Lord said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. His ministry began at that point. And then it ended on the cross where he shed his blood the Bible says, uh, for our sin. And so Jesus came by water and blood. Now there's a deeper meaning to this, and I want us to look at a couple of things uh, through the remainder of what I have to say. Uh, one of the things that you find is, as John says this, this is his answer to what uh, we call now the Serinthian heresy. Not the Corinthian heresy, but the Serinthian heresy. And the Serinthians were a group of people that believed the wrong things about Jesus. And one of the things that they taught about Jesus is they taught that the divine, the divine spirit came upon Jesus at the moment of his baptism. In other words, before his baptism, he was just an ordinary fellow. And then the divine spirit was on him all the way through his three years of ministry, culminating with his time on the cross. And they will say... That, uh, that, or they, they taught that the divine spirit also left Jesus just before uh, he, is, uh, he is crucified. So to them, what they are saying is that Jesus is just a man that died like any other person. There was nothing unusual about his death. He died as, uh, as any of us do or any of us will uh, there on the cross. Verse 6 is written by John to refute that particular false Doctrine. The truth is that Jesus didn't begin uh, his divine walk when he is baptized. He is always God. Amen. He is always God. When he was born, we, you know, last week was, uh, you know, as, as we were focusing on the Christmas season, Matthew 1 tells us that, uh, quoting prophecy, he said, that his name shall be Emmanuel, which is God with us. And so when Jesus was born on this earth, he was as much God as he ever was at any other point in his life. This is who, this is who Jesus actually is. And the truth is that Jesus was God's son, not only from the beginning of his ministry, but also to the end. And he was not only God's son, from the beginning of his ministry, but he was also God's son from the moment that he was born on this earth. This is who he, he always was. And so 
Uh, it's important for us to remember this as we think about our Savior. Now, I've had questions about this. People ask questions uh, about the baptism of Jesus, and they say, why is this important? Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Have you ever thought about that? You know, it's an easy answer for me as I think about why I was baptized. I know that uh, one of the things that is to follow when, when I give my heart and life to Jesus Christ, the next step, now it is, it, it, it is not determined my salvation, baptism does not save, but the next step following belief is baptism if you want to be obedient to the Lord, amen? So in our, in our church, one of the things that we do is we uh, issue an altar call, we try to win people to Jesus, and the next step after that is we ask for people uh, to be baptized. Now, what is baptism? This may get us uh, to a deeper understanding of what, uh, why we do it. What, what is baptism? Baptism is a mark of identification. It's a mark of identification. In other words, what you're saying is, I am identifying either with what this group teaches or I'm identifying with the God that they worship. I'm identifying with the message that is there. Those are all important things. And so Jesus submitted to baptism. He didn't need to be baptized because he was a, uh, was a sinner, but he wanted to be identified with the message that John the Baptist preached. And you remember what his message was. Repent, right? John preached the same message that Jesus did. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so Jesus, in submitting to baptism, was identifying himself with, uh, with, uh, with what John was teaching. Now, if you look a little bit further there in chapter 5, you'll find, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, uh, and the Holy Spirit. The, uh, these three are one, and then there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Uh, these three, he says, uh, agree uh, as uh, one. And you know, one of the things that we find that takes place when Jesus is baptized, one of the things that occurs is all three persons of the Trinity converged in that moment. God the Son came out of the water. Amen? He came out of the water. God the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And God the Father said, this is my Son in whom I am well Pleased. We see that the baptism of Jesus is an important event. It's important because he wanted to be identified with. Now, the best way I know to explain this, you know, you, you guys have been around me long enough. Uh, you know, I, 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 like, uh, I like ball. I like, I like football. I like basketball. I like baseball. I like all those things. I, I have a love-hate relationship with golf, uh, admittedly. But uh, anyway, uh, but... Uh, what happens when a person is baptized? They're identifying with a group of people. Uh, years ago, uh, I saw Mark McGuire uh, when he was the first baseman for the uh, Oakland A's at the old Texas Rangers Stadium. And I went early and I went to watch him take batting practice. The jersey he wore had an Oakland A's insignia on it. And man, he could hit that baseball. I'm telling you, now we know there are reasons why now he could hit it that hard, but he could hit that baseball. And he hit just about every ball out of the park when he was taking batting practice. I've never seen anything like that. But years later, he was traded to another team. And so his mark of identification had to change. He was no longer in Oakland A. He was now in St. Louis, and the baseball team in St. Louis is the St. Louis Cardinals. He had to shed that Oakland A's jersey because now the Cardinals was his mark of identification. He identified with them. And when we get baptized, that's what we do. We say, I no longer identify with the world. I now identify with Jesus Christ. I identify with this church. I identify with their doctrines, with their teachings, so on and so forth. And this is what Jesus is doing when he is baptized by John. We also know about the significance of the blood. When John is speaking about this blood, this is he who came by water and blood, what John is saying is that Jesus is just as much God on the cross as he was during the rest of his earthly ministry. Jesus did not stop being the Son of God on the cross. He did not stop being God when he was hung on that cross. He didn't cease being who he was. He was always Jesus the Son of God, God in human flesh, dying 
for you and me. And this is a consistent message that we see over and over and over and over in the New Testament. Uh, Paul said it to, to his uh, young disciple Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so the water and the blood is important for us to talk about. And it is important for us to remember that every time that the gospel is preached, every time an opportunity is, uh, a door is open for the gospel to be presented, every time behind the pulpit or whether in a, even in a Sunday school class, we talk about the gospel, the Holy Spirit is testifying about Jesus. As poor of a job as I'm doing trying to preach this morning, the Holy Spirit is transcribing that and testifying that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Savior, that he died on the cross for our sins, and he's our only hope in this world. And this world needs a lot, needs a lot of hope. We find it in Jesus. So there's the truth about his divinity, his ministry. Let's also remember the truth about Jesus' difficulty. I believe that uh, John had a deeper meaning regarding the, uh, the water and the blood. Uh, if, if you'll take your Bibles, turn over with me, if you will, to the book of John, John 19. I want you to look with me in verse 34. And we're in the middle of Christ's time uh, on the cross. He has now died. And verse 34 adds a curious side note to the death of Jesus. It says in verse 34, but one of the soldiers, it says, pierced his side with a spear. You're familiar with this story. He pierced his side with a spear. And immediately, what does it say came out? Immediately, the Bible says, blood and water came out of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So imagine this event that is taking place that we're reading about. Jesus is now dead on the cross. The price has been paid for our sins. The Roman soldier came to break his legs because they couldn't have anybody during this time of the year remaining on the cross according to Jewish custom. He had to die. And so uh, what they did was they went to the thieves on either side. You know, Jesus was crucified between two thieves and they broke their legs and because their legs were broken, they would no longer be able to sort, support their body, and so they would eventually suffocate there. And the soldier came to do the same with the Lord Jesus, to break his legs. But Jesus was already dead. He's already dead there on the cross. The deed has been done. And yet the hate does not end there. In, in a bitter act of hatred, the soldier took a spear and thrust the pointed tip into the side of our Savior. And as that spear penetrated his side, out came uh, an abundance of water and blood. Now, because of what we read in John 19 and verse 34, some, uh, some physicians, uh, will, physicians will tell us that they believe that Jesus died of a broken heart there on the cross. Now, we know this scientifically. Around the heart, there is a sack of and sometimes when a heart bursts, that sack of fluid will also burst, producing water. And so as Jesus' side is penetrated, that broken heart produced the water and also the blood that came pouring out of him. I want you to think about what this means. Jesus had the weight of the world on his shoulders. He was carrying the sin of the world on the cross. And I think it broke his heart. I really think it broke his heart as he is there on the cross. The thought of what he was doing, the strain and the pain, and the weight that he was carrying on that day was too much for his heart to carry, and his heart was broken. Water and blood. Water and blood also has deep meaning to us today, even in our own lives. We see the cleansing of water, and it represents our daily and devotional cleansing. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse with the washing of the water by the word. You know, the scripture teaches us there that we all need a water bath. Amen? We all need a water bath. 
And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, we know physically we need, that. We, we, uh, we need to do that. I can remember when I was a little boy, my parents always knew whether I'd taken a bath or not because I was a stinky boy that liked to play outside all day, particularly in the summer. And you need a water bath. A little boy needs a water bath to get clean. Amen? Uh, you can't go around stinking your whole life. Amen? But spiritually, we also need a water bath. And we can be cleansed by the word. You know, one of the things that I have found is that when I expose my mind, when I expose my heart, when I expose my spirit to the word of God, that the word of God can cleanse me. In other words, my thinking changes. Have you ever had your mind changed by what you've read in the scripture? Any of you ever had that happen? Am I the only one in here that's had that happen in my life? Yeah. And so the word of God can cleanse you as you read it. The wash by the word. What I'm saying, Baptist, listen to me. You are not, you are not fit enough. You are not clean enough. You, you are not important enough in and of yourself to be able to get by in your own life without the word of God in your life. And you need the word of God to consistently wash you and cleanse you consistently in your life. Amen? We also see the cleansing of the blood on the cross. There, it, as, as Jesus is there, not only do we see the cleansing of water, but also the cleansing of the blood. And we know how important the blood is. You know, it's a sad thing in our, in our modern day uh, where uh, we push progressive thoughts and progressivism has moved its way into the church building in so many places. There are too many, too many preachers that are compromising today. Too many churches that are compromising. We, we see, I see some churches that put up flags that should not be in the church, making stands that they, they should not be making. Years ago, there was one denomination that made the determination that they would no longer include songs or hymns about the blood of Jesus Christ in their hymns because it was considered to be too offensive. Well, let me say this first of all. The shedding of blood is offensive. But without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. I was sent on a mission trip years ago, Jay, to a uh, uh, place in Africa. And, you know, one of the things that as they were training us on what that we were supposed to be doing, they said, you can't use the word blood. The word blood is offensive because this place that you're going to used to be uh, an English colony. And in the English colonies, they had the British mindset, and the word blood is considered an offensive term. And I told them I can't preach without talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. And I said, besides, blood is in the Bible. Amen? You're going to tell me I can't preach on something that's in the Bible. And so when I went there, the first place that I went to, you know the first thing that I talked about? I quoted, I quoted uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I said, now I know with many of you, this may be offensive, and it is offensive because sin is offensive. And the only way that we could be cleansed is by Jesus Christ dying on the cross and shedding his blood. I hope it offends. I hope it shakes people up when we talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope it breaks hearts. I hope it changes lives. I hope it is alarming and stunning because the death of Jesus and the blood that he shed is all of that. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul said, Now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so now, now because of what Jesus has done, you know, David was talking about uh, earlier about how uh, he's praying for relationships to be restored. You know, those things are, are very important. What Jesus did is he restored the most important relationship, the broken relationship that God had with man. And the chasm has now been crossed. The sin barrier has now been broken because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and I. In 1 John chapter 1, in verse 7, 
John would tell us that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There's no program out there that can do for you what Jesus can do. There's no steps that you can take outside of what Jesus has done for you. You can't save yourself. You can't help yourself. But Jesus can. And because Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross, we now have this salvation that we can all celebrate. And if you do not know him today, I want to tell you there's no better time than now and no better time than today to give your heart and life to Jesus. We sing about it, and we have in the past. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? <coughs> Excuse me. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, my friend, I want to invite you to give your heart and life to him today. I'm not going to do anything as horrible as asking you to come up and talk to me, but I'm sure we have a couple of deacons that would be glad to speak with you if you need prayer this morning, if you need someone to share with you about what needs to happen in your life in order to be born again. If you have other matters you need to pray about uh, during this time we call an invitation, I'm going to invite you to come forward and spend some time in this altar there at the, uh, here at the front. Or if you have things that you need to deal with right now where you're at in the pew, God hears you no matter where you are. Amen? He hears you no matter where you are. And so we're going to ask for you to come and respond and do as the Lord leads this morning. Stand with me, if you will. We're going to, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then following this word of prayer, we'll have our invitation. Noah's going to get up, and he's going to lead us in this invitation, and then you'll come uh, during this time. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day, and as we're here, we pray that, Lord, you would, uh, Lord, not only uh, uh, hear our cries to you, whether it's to, uh, to commit our lives to Christ, or whether it is to make a recommitment, or whether it is to just express ourselves in a sincere act of worship before you. We pray that you would hear. We pray that you would move as only you can. And I pray that Jesus would be glorified, signifying the fact that the Holy Spirit has been at work in this building today. We ask this now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You come now as the Lord leads. soul are you weary and troubled no light in the darkness you see there's life for a look at the savior and life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there or oh, us sin no more have dominion for more than conquerors we are Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, 
and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you, Noah. You may be seated. We're going to uh, uh, observe the Lord's Supper. I'm going to ask for our deacons, if they could, to come forward. Now, I want to let you know, you have no worries. I am not touching anything on the communion table, so... I don't want to be a, a spreader.